Here at Levels, we're building tech that helps people to understand their metabolic health, and this audio feed is a collection of the different Clubhouse sessions we've been a part of. So this session was originally recorded on April 4th, 2021, and this was the Remote Culture Show on Clubhouse, an initiative between Levels and GitLab. It's one that Sam Korkos, co-founder and CEO of Levels, and Darren Murph, head of remote at GitLab, the two of them came up with the idea to have this show where they could talk about anything from tools and best practices for building remote companies to even things like fundraising. And so this week we had Justin Mitchell, founder of Yak, Kryn Tan, founder of Kona, Jonathan Sedereth, founder of Turing, Sam Korkos, Darren Murph, and myself, Ben Grenell, also part of the startup team at Levels. And there was a lot of thinking, a lot of really rich conversation that came out of it. Some interesting ideas and perspectives about how different companies, different people use platforms. We even talked about email. Is email good tooling for communication? It seems to be this epic debate and there's not really an answer. But what it comes down to is process. How much process is there behind the tools that are being used? Well, we addressed all of these things in the conversation. And where we started it off, of course, was talking about tools. Tools are tools, and you can't really build a house with a single saw or a single hammer. It just doesn't work that way. And the more that you try to force one tool to do one job, sometimes it doesn't do the job that you need to do. And so you can get a lot of benefit from stacking tools on top of each other, but they can also get out of hand pretty quickly. And so it would be cool to hear from Sam some of your thoughts on stacking tools and how you think about it. It's a challenging question. I think a lot about knowledge management and it's a, it's a frustrating problem because certainly at different stages of a company, knowledge management becomes harder or at the very least different. We use Notion for a lot of our knowledge management. We use email and Slack for a lot of our communications. We use a clubhouse, which is a task, not this clubhouse, a different clubhouse for task management for engineering. We do a lot of our other task management in Notion. There are a lot of different tools that do different things well. We're exploring using Basecamp for a lot of our task management and communication, which also has some knowledge management. I know Miz, who's listening and now, he's put together a pretty good walkthrough on how we might switch over to that. But I I put a lot of thought into knowledge management broadly, and I'm, I'm especially curious to hear how other people manage it because I I remember Lenny Roshitsky posted something on Twitter a little while ago on how people do corporate knowledge management. And it was interesting. It has something like a hundred responses, and I think a hundred of those one hundred responses just mentioned a tool and not a process. And like they said, we we manage all of our knowledge in Google Sheets or Google Docs or Notion, but process is really what solves for most of this. So I'm I'm especially interested to learn from others on the on this event how they what process they use and how they manage knowledge and comms. I think that's a really interesting point. I'll just chime in to say, like, I think the best tools push you into a process without you even realizing it. So totally. I, I hundred percent agree on that point. I just think like, it's funny. I talk about Yak a lot as like a, a app, but I'll specifically always mention to people that as much as it is software, it's a way of working. Like it's a different system of, you know, processes and communication rules and regulations, how you communicate with your team. So I I think for knowledge management, a lot of the best tools push you into those flows. Like I think Notion does that really well. They have all these templates that you can just like one click create and you go, oh, okay, so this is how I'm supposed to use it. And then you just get kind of stuck doing that way. And uh, I agree 100%. And speaking of knowledge management, I, in, when we think about tools, we actually think about workflows at Turing and like what problems we want these tools to solve. And for me, as uh, a founder of a company, 
by and large, there are three main sort of elements of, of tools that come up, at least in our company. The first is capturing the plan. I mean, capturing what you want to share in the best possible uh, format. And I think Sam spoke about Notion and a few other tools. The second is communicating and sharing uh, that knowledge or that plan to get everybody aligned. I feel like one of the hardest and most important things in a startup is keeping everybody aligned on the, on the most important lever, that most important next scaling bottleneck. So, so there's a bunch of tools and I'm curious to hear from others like what you use to sort of keep everyone aligned. And the third is uh, having a workflow to catch deviations from the plan early. So those are one of the three elements that I think about when I think about tools. How do you capture the plan or knowledge? The second, how do you communicate that, share that, keep everyone aligned? And third, how do you catch any deviations to the plan early so that you can take corrective measures? So I think about tools in terms of what tools could we use to help us do these three things asynchronously, efficiently, effectively. And uh, that, that's, that's my two cents. Yeah, and I just want to chime in real quick. I think the idea of the fact that your like tool stack can evolve as your company evolves is also really important. So we're probably the smallest startup in this group. We're about four people. The tool stack that we use is probably really different than the tool stack that Turing uses or the tool stack that Yak uses. It just, I believe that it grows as you grow. So for example, we use Tandem, but for a team that's probably 10 or up, I'm not sure if Tandem would work as well, given that there's so many rooms, so many people picking each other. And so I think it's really important to kind of iterate and kind of assess, like, are we able to stay in alignment with the size that we're at and able to kind of maintain these asynchronous processes with the scale that we're going to be growing in the near future? Yeah, I mean, I think that's super uh, valid. We talk about that a lot at Yak that, you know, a lot of these like synchronous tools are amazing and they're super cool. And the way that they're pitched is totally accurate. And then when you get like 10 people on your team, they completely fall apart. Or as soon as you start involving people from a different time zone or just a different lifestyle, you know, Corinne, like we obviously know your team really well. You know, you guys are all really young. Start, you start having kids and you have babies and you have people you have to pick up from school. You can't hang out in the tandem room anymore. It just doesn't work anymore. Sure. Yeah, I, just, I think it's super accurate what you said that you have to kind of evolve, you know, as your team evolves. And, you know, one thing that I trumpet a lot when I, I've done a lot of talks on just like efficiency and productivity, because like my main mission in life is to work less. I love working. I love what I do, but I don't like committing a ton of time to it. I like to be as super efficient, get a ton of output and really monitor my input. And a lot of that comes down to my tool stack. And I talk about this a lot when I do these kind of presentations is just investing in tools. Put $4,000 into your MacBook and buy the top tier best MacBook you can possibly buy because it'll be faster. <laughs> it'll load things quicker. You won't be waiting on something to render and just sitting there not being productive because the amount of time that you would save just by having that nice MacBook, you can you know double, triple, 10x your you know output just by being faster. And that means more money in your pocket typically, especially you know I come from an agency world where time kind of equals money. How much time are we spending getting customers, doing work for our customers? And a lot of that has to do with just being efficient. So we have all these tools and this kind of stack of productivity workflows, um, as Jonathan kind of said, that we invest in. Like we put a good amount of money into these tools and they're not just SaaS tools. Like I have a bunch of Mac apps that just level me up on my Mac to make me faster. And I'm constantly building these Mac apps myself just to keep myself going faster. Okay. Question for you, Justin, when should we think about using a tool like Yak with asynchronous communication versus something like a Slack or versus these synchronous video conferencing tools like a Tandem or a Zoom? Like, how do you think about workflows? What problems are best solved with async and what problems, how, how, what do you recommend sync? It's a great question. I mean, I think there's a time and place for sync always. I think first time meetings should be, you know, video calls or phone calls because it's a great way to you know, introduce yourself for the first time. But really, Yak starts to become incredibly valuable once you're not all perfectly aligned on the same schedule. There's a lot of things that could cause that. Like I said, maybe it's just family life. You have kids you have to pick up from school at 3 p.m. You can't make a meeting every day at that time. You live in a different time zone. That's a huge one. We talk about kind of the inclusivity of Yak, and a lot of that has to do with 
different personalities, people who feel comfortable speaking up in a synchronous environment and, and don't, or even just people in different parts of the world. You can't ask your engineer to join a stand-up call at 2 a.m. his time. That's interruptive to his life and it's not respecting his time. Likewise, you can't do that stand-ups call and just not have him there for it because he lives in a different time zone. You know, both of those are kind of anti-inclusivity. And so Yak works really well when you start having a global workforce. It definitely works well where you have a number of people when you start to hit a threshold of just too many meetings because there's too many people that need to all stay in sync. One thing that we talk about a lot is that typically meeting culture, meetings in general, are brought out of a fear. It's a fear of not being synced up. Like, oh, I don't think this person knows what I know. Or maybe these two people don't know what each other know. And so we need to have this meeting to get everybody together just so that everybody can get on the same page. And our kind of thesis behind Yak is that you could just have better communication and you can achieve that same goal and not live in that kind of constant fear of like, we need to have all these meetings just to ensure that nobody is going down the wrong path. So as soon as you start to get to these bigger numbers, you know, seven, eight people on your team, anybody, just one person, all it takes is one person on a different time zone to completely screw up a synchronous workflow. You know, one thing that I would uh, encourage leaders and, and startup founders to take from this incredibly rich intro conversation is that I think we're reaching a point where we aren't going to choose our tools so much for the productivity and efficiency gains. We're going to audit and choose our tool stack by which ones reinforce our values the most. And this is a much healthier way to choose what tool that you use, because there are a lot of ways to get things done within a company. And in a, especially in a remote first type of setting where you aren't likely to have people synced up in the same time zone, you are more likely to have people with very diverse lifestyles and finding their identity outside of work. It's going to come down to which tools do we choose that reinforce the values that matter to us. At GitLab, we actually use the GitLab platform to collaborate, and we've specifically built it in a way that forces transparency. Transparency is one of our core values, and instead of just assuming that everyone will always default to that, we try to build and use tools that reinforce that. And when you find this nice balance between the tools that you're using, reinforcing the values, and then your values enabling you to use the tools the ways in a way that they should be used, there's this beautiful harmony that comes from that. And I think a lot of the global Zoom fatigue and a lot of the friction that you're seeing on people that are in a virtual world now, but still trying to work using office-centric tools, that is the friction. There is some incongruence between the values that work well in a remote-first setting and the tools that were already used in an office-first setting. So question on that, Darren, you're talking about using tools that align with your values, but are there certain tools that, that are essential for remote companies and then ones that might be dangerous when used incorrectly? Like the thought is, I mean, you can, you can take a tree down with a sawzall, but it's not the right tool when you need a chainsaw, right? And so the same thought goes for like tooling that we might use in a company. Some might lead you down either an unproductive path or just the wrong path altogether. It's a great question. I would say choose your tools and use them in a way that become forcing functions. So I'll give you an example. We use Slack at GitLab. A lot of teams use Slack for communicating back and forth through text. But we use it in a very unusual way. We expire all of our Slack messages after 90 days. And the reason we do this is it is a forcing function for us to document and use GitLab, the platform, for our core collaboration tool. It essentially makes it impossible to get any work done in Slack, and that is exactly what we want to do. It reinforces a lot of our substantiating values by not making Slack a place that's just anxiety ridden and another form of chaos. And you mentioned the cutting down the tree example, but, but here's the thing. What if your company really valued quiet time? And you said, you know what? We want to cut this forest down the quietest way possible. Well, for your company, the chainsaw would actually be the wrong approach. You may just want to equip everyone with a finely sharpened ax 
and say, this is quieter than using chainsaws. But if that wasn't something you valued, then maybe you use a different tool slightly differently. And that's why I say this is a very personal decision and it really comes down to what your team aligns on in terms of value. What do you value? What is your forcing function? What are you trying to get people? How are you trying to get people to use a certain tool? You gotta remember that humans are very inventive, dynamic creatures. So just plopping a tool down in front of them and assuming they'll understand how everyone else is using it could create some chaos. And so I've advised remote first companies that are introducing new tools to become more remote first, to also add a layer of learning and development to make sure that people actually have a usage guide on how to best take advantage of these tools and use them in the way that your specific company wants them to be used. So one more follow-up. This is, this is like a general question because there's a, a lot of builders on the stage right now. And so when there comes a point where you think, wow, we need a new tool for this. And you've got the ability, because you build tools, you've got the ability to build something, either as a feature within your own stack or build something completely new. Like where, where does that decision come that you think, hey, maybe we can like find a new way to work using X, Y, and Z? I can speak on behalf of Turing. So for us, the first question we asked is, will building this ourselves give us a long-term strategic advantage? So in Turing, for example, we are about helping people push a button to hire and manage remote developers. So you can hire a pre-vetted developer and then we build some tools to make it easy for you to work with that remote developer. So we didn't start with, what do we build? We started with first by using as many best in class tools that we could reuse. And then if it turned out that building this was key to making that remote collaboration with the developer successful, then we would invest in building it. The default was always, no, we are not gonna build this. And then there has to be a strong enough business case to build it. And in many cases where maybe you want to have access to certain data that gives you a long-term moat, uh, that could be a good reason or in, in many of Turing's unique problems that we solved, there simply weren't tools that solved a specific problem exactly the way we wanted it to be solved, so we, so we build. So our default is always to use the best existing tool out there, unless it adds to some kind of strategic long-term advantage uh, for us. Darren, I'm curious on your end, how do you quote unquote force a team to use a tool a certain way? Like obviously, you at an admin level say, hey, we're going to expire our Slack messages, but how do you encourage people to not get like stuck in a back and forth, you know, Slack argument? Like, is there, you know, processes that you put in place? Do you remind people if someone's like blown up the general channel with a bunch of at here's? Is there disciplinary action for using a tool incorrectly? Or is it just an amazing work culture and everybody does everything right the first time? No, this is a great question and something we're always iterating on. Look, the heart of it is it, it, everyone at GitLab can answer everything with a link. So the fact that we're a documentation first culture really helps. So for example, if you see a new hire drop this four paragraph missive in a public Slack channel, right away, you're like, oh, they, they missed that on onboarding. They don't know that this is not the appropriate place for this collaboration to happen. And they probably don't know that it's going to completely vanish in 90 days. So what likely happens then is the next person who sees that goes into the Slack thread and just drops the link to the GitLab handbook that says, hey, we don't work in Slack. Please create a GitLab issue or a merge request. And it only takes one or two times before you just get it and you normalize answering with a link. But for things like what, when do we pivot from one tool or another, we try to document that too. If you go back and forth more than three times on Slack or some other medium asynchronously about the exact same thing and there's clearly a miscommunication, then we say, look, maybe a quick five, eight minute sync call is justified to unblock that. Or ask yourself, is the thing you're going back and forth on, is it possible to break that down into a smaller type of question? For example, if we're trying to iron out the FY22 marketing plan, we're probably going to go back and forth more than three times. 
but you could probably break that down into 30 or 40 individual questions, many of which could be answered asynchronously, ideally using the GitLab platform. So we try to document this as much as possible. And each time someone on our team finds a new loophole or a new um, series of events that hasn't been answered yet, we try to find the most efficient solution and then document that as well. So I'm going to at here at channel at Sam Corcos to bring up the epic debate to Darren's point of like, when is the right time to transition to different platforms given the form or I, I guess the type of communication that's needed. And so there is this epic debate around email and whether or not it's good tooling, whether or not it's a good or a bad communication platform. And I know Sam has a ton of thoughts on this. Yeah, I mean, it's all, uh, it's a relative question. I think relative to using text messaging or Slack or other synchronous tools that masquerade as asynchronous tools, it's much better, but it does have downsides. And this is something that we've seen on the team where oftentimes there's a lot of communication related to a particular project that happens in email that not everyone has visibility into and decisions get made on our communication platform that's totally separate and disconnected. And that, that causes problems. Things get spread into multiple conversations and things get confused. I don't know, we're, we're actively considering using something like Basecamp, which would consolidate a lot of other, it would consolidate a lot of our communication, our task management, and some of our documentation as well. So I think that it's one of the things that I've noticed in conversation with people is that I think there's an underlying assumption that one of the reasons why people really dislike email is because I think most people don't appreciate the baseline overhead that comes with running a company and the amount of communication that is strictly necessary. So email is not a bad tool in and of itself. But most people in a leadership role need to spend several hours per day communicating with people. And whether that's done in email, whether that's done in GitLab, however it's managed, it, it's, a, it's a much bigger piece of overhead and it can accumulate very quickly. And it's, it's often a lot more than people are willing to put into it. I think it, it's, uh, to, to add to Sam's point, it's also helpful to set a uh, protocol or etiquette around some of these different channels and to define them clearly. For example, for me, I use Slack for, for a discussion that probably spans the course of a day, like several hours during that day. I use email when it's uh, a discussion or a thread that might span multiple days or a week. The, the expectation is that you don't have to like respond right away. You can respond, respond anytime over the next uh, couple of days. Whereas with Slack, the expectation on response time is a lot uh, shorter. And I have text messages and phone calls for like an emergency channel. If somebody wants to reach me for something really urgent out, outside of sort of even like nights and weekends, something like that. Like, so I use text and phone calls for that. So I kind of, I, I feel like one thing that helps is setting these expectations around these channels around when to use what, what the average response time is likely to be. Uh, I think that also goes a long way. Sometimes. The, the ambiguity leads to needless stress for people. I think that's also a, a culture thing, kind of to Darren's earlier point is, you know, response times and the way that you deal with different forms of communication a lot of times comes down to a culture level. And I think the base guy, camp guys talk about this a lot. And one of the things that we had in mind when building Yak was specifically building a culture around an it can wait mentality, which is something that Jason talks about in, in one of the books. Uh, I think it doesn't have to be crazy at work. And a lot of that has to do with pushing people into this new <laughs> exciting idea of like, maybe instant gratification won't happen, right? Maybe you won't get an answer right away and you'll have to wait. But what we've tended to do inside of our own company is build a system around like, don't let other people be a stopping point for you. And so a lot of our tasks are set up in a way that ensures that like other people aren't waiting on someone else to either make a decision or commit some code or answer a question. And everybody can kind of still work independently and then come together, you know, and, you know, merge all that stuff at the end versus this waterfall effect of like, oh, well, I sat here and twiddled my thumbs for three hours. 
because we use an async messaging tool and somebody didn't get back to me. And so I wasn't able to be productive. And so a lot of what we've worked on is specifically having systems in place that encourage you to like send your question, go off and do something else, maybe even just take a walk and relax for a little bit so that you can come back and give that person enough time to respond. And we just have a culture around, you know, kind of average response times. I'll, I'll queue up Corinne here a little bit because I think that maybe there's an opportunity just to talk about culture and tools around culture and specifically, you know, like how your team prefers to communicate or be communicated to. For sure. And perfect teeing up. I think so for context, Kona is a culture platform for remote teams. And we have basically based the entirety of our tooling and features on feedback that we've gotten from culture focus managers. At this point, we've talked about 500 of them since last last January. Overall, I love that Darren mentioned how tooling needs to be value-based. I can say that like, like, of course you can choose among like a whole toolbox of tools, but when it comes to like asynchronous communication and an in, it can wait mentality, you need that kind of foundation of trust and transparency. Like I think Dewis had this great quote where it's like, you only get flexibility when you stop monitoring your employees and when you stop expecting instant responses in order to ensure some sort of alignment. So if you actually trust your teammates, which is easier said than done, you can actually start to build processes and forcing factors that reinforce that trust. What we mean there is that the ability to kind of be vulnerable, admit when you need help with something, the idea that you can actually like show up as your full self at work, all of these things contribute towards that overall level of trust and this trust needs to be maintained. I think the reason why so many folks tilt towards a meeting first culture is because they expect that face-to-face -face time will allow them to reduce the amount of transactional talk, allow you to kind of see who you're talking to and treat them like human. Unfortunately, with the onslaught of Zoom meetings, we see the exact opposite. Folks that are so used to be on these Zoom meetings actually just kind of blaze right past, go straight to the agenda items and just knock it out, boom, boom, boom. Instead, if we're actually able to sort of slow down, ask how folks are doing, um, wild concept. If you ask how folks are doing and really prioritize how folks are like, how they are emotionally, we're actually able to realize that a lot of the communication, a lot of the miscommunication has to do with a lack of context and not necessarily the nature of written communication itself. So it's all about getting context and it's all about treating people like people. Darren, any additional thoughts on, on tooling? If anyone has questions too, feel free to put up your hand and bring you up on stage. Yeah, I think it's it's vital to implement tools with usage guardrails. There is something to be said about implementing a tool with a pilot team and saying, hey, tell us the good, bad, and the ugly. Just use it in any way that you see fit. But when it's going to be properly implemented to set culture, like was just mentioned, you really do need rails around it. Deleting Slack messages after 90 days sets a certain culture at GitLab. It makes sure that we spend time in Slack in the parenting channel or the hiking channel or the mental health channel, being humans to one another instead of trying to intermix informal communication and workplace operations in the same exact medium. And this is really critical in a remote first company. All we have is a digital office, so we have to make sure that they are properly compartmentalized. I would say leaders in general need to understand how much tooling impacts culture, whether you want it to or not. So be as intentional as you can, because Jonathan's earlier mention on, I use Slack for discussions within a day, or I use email for discussions within a week, text messages for urgent. These things need to be explicitly laid out so that there is a shared understanding of what a red bubble in any of those mediums actually means. Because leaving that unsaid is the source of great mental anguish and anxiety. And it generally hurts the most the people who can least afford for this to happen, especially for people who have never worked remotely before. So they're doubly on edge that they're going to be monitored and watched and need to be uh, in incredibly responsive to everything. This may get you some short-term productivity gains, but it is not a healthy, long-term, sustainable way to run an operation. And so for leaders who are experiencing this for the first time, be very mindful that the tools you choose and the guardrails you do or do not set up very much uh, plays into the culture that you're building. 
I think there's a ton to be said just about encouraging your team to go red on Slack. I think especially what Darren just said about companies or teammates that have come from companies that had a little bit more of the Orwellian style monitoring systems where someone was always checking to make sure you were online, you were always being productive. I think there's a lot of employees that will be hired in the next year that will be very used to that and will not understand that not every company is this taskmaster that needs them to be constantly online, constantly working, constantly typing away. And that's sometimes just leaving for like an hour, taking a walk or sitting by the lake for lunch and just chilling away from a computer is massively, massively conducive to better productivity. I have a question for Kareem. Kareem, it, it, what Kona's doing seems super interesting about helping remote managers track the morale of their teams and to lead with empathy. Is there anything that you could share with us in terms of your top three pieces of advice on how to lead with empathy? Yeah, definitely. Um, also kind of a big question because I think that's the question that we're always trying to explore. I think first off, it really starts with like creating a space where that kind of vulnerability is rewarded and not Orwellian style punished. It boils down to psychological safety and the idea that being your true self, saying that there are problems that you're dealing with, you won't be punished for admitting to that. Psychological safety has a ton of research backing it. You could totally just read up Brene Brown. She's fantastic. But I think that kind of baseline of vulnerability and embracing that is first like a huge foundational piece of leading with empathy. That also includes kind of why we why Kona has these emotional check-ins. We do kind of this quick red, yellow, green check-in where folks can say whether they're green for great or red for terrible, yellow for in-between. And what we've seen among our users is just this amazing onslaught of support and warmth once folks put a yellow. I think there's a huge kind of aspect of like a fear that we need to report anonymously in order to protect folks' truths. But when folks are actually able to own up to their problems and issues, you actually have this huge trust-based environment that is developed where folks can support one another. So again, foundation of vulnerability is the first point. The second point I think is, I would say making sure that managers are trained. I think GitLab does a fantastic job, but really baking manager training into these processes. That way, when they see somebody come up with vulnerability, some sort of issue, they know how to deal with that. I think all too often we promote folks that do not have any manager experience prior. It's mostly promoted based off of technical capability and promoted because they are, let's just say the best coder, but not necessarily the best people manager. And as soon as you're promoted to some sort of manager position, the amount of soft skills that you need skyrockets. And it's a completely different ballgame. So making sure that every single manager at your organization has that baseline training of like, what are the processes around one-on-ones? What are the processes around difficult conversations? How can I make sure that I support folks through their mental health and what resources are available to them? Equipping your middle managers, your front linesmen with all these really, really helps. And then I think the third one And I'm really trying to think to make sure that I I cover all the bases, but I think it's just an idea of open feedback and iteration. You're not gonna get it right on the very first try. And so if you have this culture of vulnerability and this culture of constant learning, then then the next thing is just feedback and making sure that you're constantly asking for feedback both up and down the line, making sure that folks feel like they can report when something's wrong and making sure that you actually iterate and act on it from the very top to the very bottom. So yeah, hopefully that answers your question. Thank you, it did. So here's a thought on to steer the conversation a little bit to behavioral economics. So we know that when given too many choices, the brain gets overwhelmed. It's apparent. It's what happens with a lot of products when they get too many features bolted onto them and then people don't even know what to do with the tool. It's what makes WhatsApp successful. It's what makes Instagram successful because it is this for that. And so like Justin, you've got this opportunity to basically build any feature you want on top of Yak, or you can decide how to keep things pretty streamlined. And what's your thought process? Like when you're building the platform, how are you thinking about some of these features and how people might use it or even how you use it internally as a team? Yeah, I mean, we're constantly discovering this too, right? So we're constantly talking to customers, finding out, you know, how they're using it, what they're doing with it. You know, I think a great example of this is we launched Yak Rooms, which is a synchronous tandem style experience inside of the desktop app. And we launched it and just didn't even say anything about it for like a super long time, just to kind of see, would people notice it? 
Would it be something that they'd be interested in? You know, do they need it on mobile? You know, what do they think of the, the feature set? And just didn't even like announce it or put any information out there and kind of watched users roll into the feature and then give us feedback about it. And that helps us decide like, okay, so if it's going to be useful to them, they need it on mobile, which I think is something that we've heard. And, you know, we've also <laughs> not really put any more engineering effort into it because we only had like four or five people end up utilizing it. And it also felt a little off brand for us as an async tool, but it took us 45 minutes one day on a Monday to spin this up and see if people would like it. And so we experiment a lot with little things like that, seeing how people use it. I think one of the biggest examples of how Yak has kind of evolved from the very beginning is, you know, we started noticing a lot of people using it with people that weren't just on their internal team. You know, we, we talk to Darren all the time on Yak and he doesn't work for Yak, but it's a great way for us to get feedback from him and have him give us some advice or information even about events and stuff like this that we should join without hopping on a phone call with him. And that kind of information has started to decide how we, you know, build a product out, what things we focus on. I think what you said is really valid. The more you add to a tool, the more complicated it gets as kind of quasi CEO, CTO. I also have to balance just how messy the code gets. You know, it's hard to maintain a product that has suddenly become spaghetti because there's so much going on. So a lot of what we're doing is staying, you know, as close to the path as possible of like an ultimate kind of like North Star goal of getting people out of meetings. And we just have to decide, you know, is this feature aligned with getting people out of meetings and just having better communication? Or is this a fun social feature? One of the big things that we've seen happen is a lot of communities and mentors and coaches have tried to get on the Yak to have kind of their community inside of an async voice messaging tool. And immediately we get all these requests for moderation and admins and one way like channels, the channels where the you know head of the community can blast a message out, but nobody can reply and you know hand raising and all this stuff for remote AMAs. And we've had to kind of ignore a lot of those features to go, that doesn't align with the core mission of you know, getting people out of meetings. It's a great use case, but it's not necessarily what we're focused on right now. And that's, you know, really just comes from having that North Star metric that we're going for is we want to get people, you know, Friday off. We want them to have so many, so much more time back in their week that they get to take, you know, a full day back out of their schedule. And all of the, you know, kind of features and buttons and presses and everything inside of the app kind of has to go through that filter of, are we aligned on giving people more time back in their day, less meetings, letting them take off Friday every week, whatever it is to kind of like reduce that load of meeting culture. Yeah, I, you know what's very interesting about that? I think the next wave of great tools are going to be the ones that give you more time back. That's going to be the new North Star. And so what I mean by that is tools that help you work less, but not just work less, waste less time in route to the results. And the, the seismic shift you're seeing here is when you had most of the world co-located, the moment that you cross that threshold into the office, from nine to five, the office owns you. So there's not a lot of additional cognitive load in adding yet another meeting or making your day somewhat more inefficient. Because if we're being more inefficient day is like, well, that's less that I have to do here in the office. It's not like I can do anything else better with this time anyway. But now when you have tens of millions of people put back in their homes, they can, they see freedom. It's right outside of their window. Everyone at all times can think of a lot better things to be doing with their time compared to wasting it en route to results. And that is going to become a chorus of voices that gets louder and louder and louder. And you're already seeing it with some of the companies trying to force entire teams back into the office or being more rigid in their approach to hybrid. There's going to be a reckoning. People are going to want tools that help them waste less time, be more efficient so that they can be people. They can spend their time in their communities with their families doing things other than being inefficient at work. And I think that's a, a net positive for society. But I don't know if we would have gotten to this place so quickly without the genie out of the bottle 
if you will, with people recognizing how much freedom there is when you aren't just chained to the office day in and day out. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a couple amazing points in there, Darren. One is this idea of just spending more time with your family. I know when we talked at the very height of the pandemic, you had made this really interesting point that just simply by eliminating the commute, you give people more time back in their day. And that has nothing to do with productivity, efficiency, tools. It's just, it gives you more time with your family simply by not having a two-way commute every day. And I think that there's this interesting dichotomy that we struggle with at Yak, which is that we built a tool that I actively do not want you to use a lot, right? Like the goal of Yak was to spend chunks of time communicating and then getting back to work so that you can log off at 5 p.m. and go enjoy your life instead of being in back-to-back -back meetings and then getting the bulk of your work done from 5 to 8 p.m. because that's the time everybody's offline and no longer in meetings. And so we have a, a product that obviously we need to satisfy, you know, daily active user requirements and activity overall to make investors happy. But at the same time, I've built around this kind of thesis of one and done. Send your message, shut the app down, get out of it and get back to work because we don't want you just thinking around all day in our app. I want you actually getting stuff done so that you can go home earlier. Sam Corcos, what are your thoughts on, Darren brought up a really interesting point. So we had Marketplace 1.0, we'll talk eBay, uh, Marketplace 2.0, Uber, DoorDash, all the classic ones where they were focused on giving people back time. And so I think if we're in SaaS 1.0, and Darren thinks SaaS 2.0 is this idea of giving people back time. What are tools that that you think of when you think of giving people back more time? Yeah, I think of it much less in terms of tools and a lot more in terms of process. Establishing the cultural norms around asynchronous communication are really important. And I think the I think it's it it cannot be understated how much more expensive synchronous time is than asynchronous time. It, it's, it's emotionally much more comfortable to schedule a meeting and to chit chat, but it does take up a lot more time. And so I, I'm a big believer time is the time is the fundamental constraint. It is inherently zero sum. A lot of other things are scalable and time really is not. So tools like Yak or, uh, Loom or other tools that allow you to turn information into content. That is, that's really the, the first principle of how you scale information. If anyone has questions too, we've got about 15 minutes left, but put up your hand and happy to bring you up on stage. Jonathan, go ahead. Looks like you had something to chime in with. Yeah, one question for the panel. What are some open white space areas that you see today where you wish there was a tool to solve this, where you're, you're sort of sensing some gap between the efficiency of uh, operating as a distributed team versus an in-office team? And for us, for example, I would say one problem that we haven't quite fully figured out is how to ensure that the same kind of relationship building where people form authentic relationships, friendships with people, people they work with, how to, how to more organically make that happen when you are a fully distributed team. We have some workarounds that we, that we do today at Turing that I'm happy to share later if people are interested, but I'm curious to hear from the panel, is there something that you do to intentionally set up the right framework for people to bond with each other and not just you know, with the people in their team? I'll answer that from the GitLab perspective. The TLDR is that there is absolutely no substitute for in-person interaction when it comes to building bonds. And to Sam's earlier point, it's really expensive to do work synchronously where the ROI is, is bonding and building culture synchronously. So we get the entire GitLab team together at least once a year, and there's an opening keynote, a closing keynote, but everything else in between is just excursions, team bonding getting to know each other. You can catalyze a lot of great asynchronous work by being intentional about getting people together in person to build those bonds. Obviously, being in a pandemic has made that much more difficult. 
but I do think that companies should make sure that they invest in in-person as a lever for culture building and, and rapport building and less of let's force people to get together in person to build strategy. That kind of stuff, if, if appropriately structured, can be done really well asynchronously. Yeah, we do the same thing. We have once or twice a year, we try and do a, a retreat where we just go all hang out for a little bit and spend some time doing non-work things. Another thing that I would say, and you know, Jonathan, I think it's interesting. I think there's a ton of tools right now trying to, you know, I guess, build that kind of relationship aspect of work, typically in some kind of gamified format. You know, one thing that we found that has helped very recently, like uh, I think Emilio's in this room, but this is just like a very, very recent last few weeks thing is every stand-ups day. So we have a stand-ups channel in Yak. Every morning, whenever it's morning for whoever that team member is, they just do a quick, like maybe one minute stand-up of what they did yesterday and what they're doing today, all over voice. And then one person randomly will do a question of the day. And that ranges from, you know, what's your favorite guilty pleasure food? What's your What's a childhood memory that you, you know, love and cherish? One was like, what's the, what's the food that like reminds you of a, a relative? And so every day we have this question of the day that somebody decides what we're going to ask. And, you know, we kind of like share that intimate detail with everybody on our team. And since it's async, I, I like that no one really feels like it's wasting their time. They can kind of like listen to these, you know, question of the days while they're out for a walk, while they're driving in the car you know, maybe when they pop in for the shower with a shower at the end of the day, and they kind of like naturally absorb this information. And it's a great way to get to know everybody else at the company. And it's a great way to kind of get those more intimate details in a format that doesn't feel like it's taking time away from everyone, which I think a lot of like culture building tools sometimes feel like a um, chore to the team. And we found that it's been super helpful for our team to do those. Yeah, I don't think I can emphasize the importance of asynchronous water cooler chats enough. When we were first building Kona, we expected it just to kind of be an emotional wellness tool where you're kind of checking in with your emotions. What we didn't expect is it for it to, be, for it to become like this huge water cooler conversation tool. When somebody marks yellow, oftentimes the things that make us yellow, feeling meh, for example, have nothing to do with work. One time somebody said that they stepped in dog shit. Another time somebody like lost their toenail to their kid's bunk bed um, while walking past. So it's just some of these hilarious, unfortunate things that happen that allows the team to kind of bond over and it's created enormous kind of results for our target companies like Hubstaff, for example, they have their customer experience team spread across 19 different time zones and they don't really have a moment for that kind of in-person meetup, face-to-face -face meetup. They use Kona to basically check in and the ability to say like, hey, this is what's going on in my life today has huge impacts for how a team can build relationships. So yeah, team building is a super, super essential part of just trust building and a team's culture. Actual LOLing like crazy. <laughs> two examples. It's great. Yeah, it, it's an interesting thing. The ace. What there are things that you just can't do synchronously or asynchronously. I think a lot of culture related stuff. I, I found that a lot of a lot of the tools that I've seen come out to solve these problems are really taking. They're taking concepts from the synchronous world and trying to shim them into the asynchronous world. And I, I think it's, it can be really challenging. I, I used to host in a pre-COVID era, I used to host weekly salon dinners, with like eight to 10 people in person. And when COVID happened, I wanted to keep doing it. And so I switched it over to Zoom and it is really hard to do a three hour Zoom call talking about philosophy. <laughs> it, it feels like work. And it was painful. I did it a couple times and realized that it's just, you, you can't do that format on Zoom. It, it, it's not possible to make it feel like it doesn't work. So I think that much like what Darren said, there are, there's a time and a place for every type of tool and doing things synchronously for personal development and team building is, uh, I, I, don't know, I don't know if there's a substitute for doing things synchronously that way. I actually want to uh, answer the original question that Ben asked, which is as a remote first team, what's a tool that you wish existed? So for 
at GitLab, one tool that I wish existed, and I think will soon, is a more automated way to update the company handbook. So for context, GitLab runs on a company handbook. It is our operating manual. We work handbook first. If it's not in the handbook, it doesn't exist, and we mean it. So what happens in a synchronous meeting when it is required is people will take temporal notes in a Google Doc, and then the meeting organizer is supposed to contextualize these takeaways and put them in their respective correct places in the company handbook so that the outcomes of that meeting benefit the maximum amount of people. But this is a very manual process. And so my hope is a tool comes along that listens in on the meeting, but then also has an API hook into the GitLab handbook and can contextualize the takeaways for us and then simply assign it to the directly responsible individual who was running the meeting for one last check to make sure that things are spelled right and the Oxford comma is there and so on and so forth before it is merged into fruition. We're almost there. We have a lot of these components that already exist and machine learning and language understanding is getting a lot better. Raw transcriptions are still a bit dubious, but I, I think we're almost there. And I think if that happens, it will really unshackle a lot of companies who are a bit concerned that going full bore handbook first, relying on documentation, like maybe their, their team just isn't ready for that. But if we can get a tool to assist, we'll, we'll be a lot closer to the utopia of more documentation and not less. Jonathan, looks like you have something. Your microphone's off there. Yep. So in terms of tools that I that I wish existed, I would I wished there were there was a better tool that puts some structure around meetings, including, you know, maybe the first step in that tool would be to discuss whether or not the meeting is needed. So maybe it's something that could be done asynchronously. And then guiding the person who's driving the meeting into filling out some key elements like, okay, is this a meeting to make a decision? Is this a brainstorm meeting? So you have to fill in certain elements like the agenda, things like that. And what do you hope to accomplish in the meeting? And integrating that with some really good recording, transcription, search, et cetera, so that the meeting is kind of captured for posterity so that people who didn't attend the meeting have excellent meeting notes. So, so with really good speech to text and some some information extraction from the meeting, including action items that came out of the meeting, maybe it's, it's automatically captured so that you don't need like, a, 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 imagine having a really competent note taker and a really good, somebody who knows how to run really good meetings, ensuring the right things are done, automating as much of that in the software itself, you know, but tracking talk times and, and, and things like that. And, and finally, my favorite feature like roughly estimating a cost to company of having the meeting. And too often, like people, it's very easy in a meeting to like call everybody, uh, more people to the meeting than necessary, but like assigning like really like a, almost like a rough dollar cost to the meeting so that you can really internalize the cost of having a meeting and then having the action items captured. That, that's something that I've wished existed. Like right now, I feel like too many meetings are kind of left to chance based on how good the person is at running the meeting and guiding the meeting. Like what if we could automate even 80% of that? This is, the, this is the magical clubhouse moment. So I have great news for you, Jonathan. So there is a tool hot out of the oven called Zembly, X-E-M-B-L-Y. So I know the founder and they're building exactly that and the early mocks are incredible. And the one thing that I'll mention to them is as the person is in the process of creating the meeting, there should be a dollar figure there that just keeps getting bigger and bigger with each additional person they add. Uh, I'm sure that's a feature they can add, but I'll connect the dots there. For those listening, Zimbly is, is looking to achieve exactly that. That's great. Can't wait to check them out. Any questions from the audience? That's a killer carve out, Darren. I had not heard of them, but very cool product feature. I think we're, we are getting close to time. So why don't we go around? We'll start with Jonathan, but where can everyone find you? And what's a, a carve out? What's something people should check out? Thank you, Ben. You can find me at, at John Sid, J-O-N-S-I-D-D on Twitter. I'm co-founder and CEO of Turing.com. We help companies hire pre-vetted remote engineers. 
If you ever wanted to push a button to hire a pre-vetted remote engineer anywhere in the world, Turing uh, would be the platform to check out. We are sort of like an Amazon for talent, like an AWS for talent. So that's Turing.com. Thank you, Ben. Crin, we can go Crin, Sam, Darren, and then Justin. Yeah, so you can find me at It's Kareen on Twitter. Uh, you can also find us at HeyKona.com. We are the culture platform for remote teams, and we're here to make remote teams happier. And yeah, I just want to give a shout out to just the like shit that's happening in the AAPI community. If you happen to have the funds to, please donate to those causes because it's just very, very heartbreaking of what's going on right now. So yeah, please, please donate if you can. Sam here. Uh, you can find me at Twitter at Sam Corcos. If you're interested in information related to metabolic health, you can definitely check out our blog, levelshealth.com slash blog. Awesome. Uh, is- you can get me at, at G Mitch on Twitter. We're also at Yak on Twitter, Y-A-C. And you can uh, connect with me over voice at yak.com slash G Mitch. You can reach me at Darren Murph on LinkedIn and Twitter. And I'll give uh, two plugs. If you want to know everything there is to know about remote through the eyes of GitLab, go to allremote.info. That will take you deep into the GitLab handbook. And on the personal side, I'm a big advocate of open adoption. I am an adoptive dad. If anyone on the call is interested in fostering or adopting, especially if you want to use your recaptured time from not having a commute to completely change your life, reach out to me. I'm an open book and would love to support.